All right. Well, first off, congratulations. That was uh, definitely the most dominant win we've seen this season so far. And one of the most dominant wins we've seen on tour. Um, I guess my first question is you've been in plenty of battles where you've either had to come back, put pressure on people, or someone's trying to chase you down. You've had to hold them off. You know, you have a 10 shot lead over Calvin, Ricky and Cole going into the final round. How, what's the difference there warming up the night before going to bed? Like, give me all the differences. Cause that's gotta be a first for you too, as at least on tour that is. Yeah. Uh, I don't really know how to think. Honestly, it was a little bit nerve wracking. Um, like I was going through a lot of scenarios in my head on like how I could really quickly lose the lead somehow. If you break um, your arm. Yeah, you know, into something stupid like, <laughs> oh, I'd hurt my shoulder on hole thirteen. I got to play lefty, and I only have eight strokes. Or, <laughs> or you know, you know, hole one, two, three. I go bogey, 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 and someone goes birdie, 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 and now they're back four. Like, I don't know. My head was just going to worst case. But so then this I was is the like, night. This is the night before you're thinking all this. Yeah, because okay. it's like. It's like everyone's kind of like thinking I have a guaranteed win, but like as the player up there, the worst comes to mind every time. Um, once I got on the course, I felt maybe a little bit more comfortable, but it was still like weird. Like, I mean, I, I know Cole was like eight back on like hole six or something, and then he made a putt to get within seven, and I was already like, oh, I'm kind of scared now when I shouldn't be. You know, if, if it's a battle where I'm, let's say I'm tied for the lead, I usually have like no problem at least maintaining the tie. You know, there's no there's no reason to worry. So I kind of just told myself, just I mean, I didn't change my game plan at all. I literally nothing changed. I didn't go for anything else. I didn't run or lay up any more putts than I usually would. I still just played the same because there's no way I shoot so bad with the same game plan I had going into the weekend. So, you know, I you know it wasn't a great round, but it was only two off the hot round. So, yeah, you know. If you're looking against the field, it was actually a, a pretty good round. Um, but uh, it was, it, it felt nice to basically have no pressure and kind of just walk in a win. That's always been like a dream of mine is to go wire to wire. I think I had the lead of the tournament from like hole eight in the first round and then never, never let it go. Jeez. What, what moment did you let those nerves and let that, like your mind wandering of like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't blow this. Like what moment did you, basically say like, oh my gosh, like I can basically just kick the disc in and win this tournament right now. Yeah. Um, I'd actually, well, it was when I parked 15 with my FD3 actually, and I had bullseye with the forehand felt really good. There's some OB on that hole. So I knew like at that point, I actually only had Cole and Ricky by five. Cause I kind of just got like a little bit of an unlucky skip into the bunker. Um, and you know, at that point up five with four to go, anything can happen. 18 is Eagle a bowl. You know, maybe if I had some pressure, it'd be a little bit tougher. Um, but then I, I went back up six and then quickly up seven, eight, and then one by eight, obviously. Um, so, I mean, probably after that shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that the, the T shot, I believe it's on 15 with like the two trees there. 14. I, Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm forgetting the par three, the little flex. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 14. That was one where I was like, is he just going to step up and like just chip a forehand, like through the gap just because that, that hole can kind of get outrageous if you hit one of those trees. But when you're at the level that you're playing at and you're feeling so good, like you said, after the fact, after the tournament, you were saying that you were just throwing the disc so well, that's, you know, when we had Calvin on here talking about his OTB open win, and we were just being like, why did you run that? What are you doing? Like, is that kind of the same vibe, the same feeling that you have of where it's like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because I know I'm going to execute it. And if I start going way off my game plan, then I can start maybe losing more strokes than I should. Um, It definitely varies. Like sometimes maybe something an opponent does, especially if it's like a closer battle, then I might actually change my game plan. Um. I remember like in Vegas this year, um, I was like 
either one back or tied for the lead at, at one point in the tournament. And there was a hole I was playing to play for par in the round, but uh, Connor Rock actually ended up pretty much parking it, and so I knew I had to go for it. So maybe in a situation like that, I changed my game plan. Um, most of the time, I still practice that shot just to you know pull it out of my back pocket if I need to. Um, but, you know, on a tee shot like 14, I watched the three guys ahead of me all turn it over too much. I actually, when we finished 13, I checked the wind because it's a good spot to see what the wind's doing on the next hole. And so I did that, saw it was a head right to left. I knew it was going to happen. All three of them got slammed and turned into cut rollers. And so I threw much more Heiser out of the hand instead of Anheuser. That way it pushed through the wind, got the distance, and then it started to flip once it got in line with the fairway sideways. And so, you know, that, that was a really good feeling shot. It's a, it's a gap where when I'm playing that good, it's not, that's not like the thing I think about. It's more about like just where the OB is at. So the gap doesn't even come to mind, it, but you know, I know, i know how it feels like if you're having an off throwing week or maybe even just having an off day, that gap can look tiny. What yeah. about like, uh, you brought up Vegas. Were you trying to like protect your lead in that one or how did that one kind of get away from you? Obviously, Connor shot a 1090 rated round or something ridiculous and was just birdie in every hole. But you keep kind of bringing that up. And I heard you talk about it in the, um, in your, uh, interviews after your, your second and third round. Yeah. So did you like learn, uh, did you learn a lot from that or, or, or kind I of mean, walk us through your mindset? I mean, a little bit. That it was kind of weird. Like the final round of Vegas for me, I felt like I had played like a 12 or 13 under round there were so many shots where I threw identical to people and I would just get the bad result of them. And then I would get, I had a, I had a roll away. I had a, I had, I think I had like four spit outs that week um, on those disc catchers, which I usually don't get. Um, and I didn't, a lot of them were like not even hard putts. I felt like, um, so I, I don't know. I felt like that week I was just getting like a little unlucky on a couple shots that like meant a, a lot. Um, but after round two, when I was averaging 1080, I had seven strokes on, three players that I'm like 20 or 30 points higher rated then. So, you know, I, I was relaxed for the first two rounds of Vegas. And then when I knew I had that big lead, I'm like, okay, you definitely can't choke it away now. And then play a bad round three. And then round four, I felt like I played fine. Um, and this is not like a diss to Connor rock, but I wasn't actually worried about him too much. I was more worried about Calvin at that point, just cause I know like Calvin's history with this tournament he's played really good here. Um, and once I had Calvin by a good bit, then Connor kind of just started to creep up. And next thing I know, he's like eight down through the front nine, just like pretty sneakily with an airballed circle one putt on hole one. Uh, he might hit like the bottom of the cage maybe, but yeah, it, just very quickly I lost the lead and I never got it back. I got within one, you know, a couple things just didn't go my way. Missed maybe a couple like 40, 50 foot putts that I probably needed to hit. And so it sucked losing that tournament by one, basically for a second time. Um, it had a pretty solid field. Calvin and Isaac were in the field and then a lot of good, like, you know, 1030 rated pros. So I was, I was definitely just trying not to have that happen again. You know, I was pretty nervous going into round three at Portland because I started off one over through four and I'm like, Oh no, it's happening again. Um, Cause round three in Vegas was my rough round. Um, but then I, I bounced back. I got a birdie and then I got nine of the next 11 holes in that third round. And then I even had an opportunity to shoot like a 12 down and actually missed like three holes at the end. Um, but yeah, overall I just felt so good to kind of, secure that win almost after the third round how are the uh crowds out there this week it was pretty solid it was like definitely one of the best if not the best the whole year i felt like in terms of how many people were there i felt like it was a pretty good sized gallery for like how it's been recently so yeah. it was really nice to see especially because like the weather was really bad um it was good to see people you know take their time out of the day it's obviously portland so they're pretty used to it but still great to see that many people out there You're muted. Oh, You're yeah. Like... He's the problem now. I'm not the problem. Easy okay. button to hit, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious to hear what, what your thoughts are on, on, on this. Brody and I were talking about a little course design earlier, not to get into the course design, but maybe styles of play. Do you like it better where 
you have, let's say you shoot two tens on a, on a course and you can really pull away from the field? Or do you like that kind of get 13, 14 under every round to kind of stay in, just to stay in the mix and really hard to pull away from the field? Do you like, do you like that because you're always kind of have an opportunity to win or would you rather a course be like Portland where if you just play good the whole time, all of a sudden you can build yourself a big time lead? Um, I mean, Portland is like, it's one of my, they're both one of my favorite courses. Um, I, th- I think obviously I'm, I mean, I'm going to like a course. I'd rather play a course that I'm going to play better at. And so Portland is like my ideal course. If I'm looking to win a tournament, because there's a lot of like, especially if your throwing feels good that week, you can bite off a lot on some of the par fours, get a little bit more aggressive, but if you're throwing good, it, it doesn't seem risky at all. Um, and I like, I think this course makes you game plan really well. Not that there's, like I said, there's not really tight lines, but there's landing zones that you, there's different ways to get to them. You need forehand and backhand out here, up shots, drives off the tee, bunch of different angles. I threw hyzer flips, I threw flat, I threw flex. I, I think the, for my success, the best part that I excel at is the far par threes that are like yeah. distance driver shots that you need over stable and accuracy. I, I feel like even at like 500 feet, I get up and down most of the time. If I have some room to work the disc, there's a lot of par threes out there. They're like 460 to 500 that I'm just, you know, cranking over a super overstable PD two or, or like a, you know, one of my new MD fives, if it's a little bit shorter of a hole, like maybe 380. And it just like, I don't know. I, I felt like, you know, I have a pretty simple bag. And when I walk up to a hole, I know that that's the disc I'm throwing. And so it just makes it really easy. There's no deciding in the head. It's all up to the player to execute the shots. Um, yeah, just just my dream course for for if I'm looking to win a tournament. Are those courses pretty much locked in at this point? I didn't, you know, I wasn't there. So it's a little bit harder to see from coverage. But it looked like uh, the final, I, I believe it's the West course. It looked like it was the same exact course as last year. So have they... They each been, had like two tweaks on them. Okay. So no, not, they, they weren't big tweaks. Okay. I, li- I like, I mean, because I think those courses are great. So I, I'm always a fan of like, hey, once we get a course that's like solid, maybe the only tweaks that we do is maybe mess around maybe with some back, basket placements. You know, the first two days we play the basket here. Last two days we put the basket over here. Maybe we change some uh, tee pad locations for some, like make some holes a little bit. Maybe make a hole a drivable par four one day and and then back it up another. But um, I I think they got to stop trying to like every year, you know, okay, these four holes are completely out. We're putting four new ones in because we got to start building some sort of kind of legacy of the course over time once it gets good which i think those courses are very good yeah i, I think like at, at those like i mean the east course i'd put like honestly like it might be my top in my top five favorite courses on like how it looks it's fun to play yeah like one it's fun to play in practice and it's fun to play in tournaments there's nothing yeah. fluky about it there's no there's no gimmicky shots except for maybe what was that you um, got you got your uh, iPad or your your iPhone doing this little effect. Okay, well, pull dude, stuff up and it, yeah, that's that's it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think there's like there's like one bad hole at the the East Course, and I know they're working on changing it. Um, at, at hole 13, you kind of just throw a driver and hope you get through. Um, there is like an outside. Oh yeah, hole, that that hole is not great. Yeah. No, not a good hole. And, you know, the course designers know that and they, you know, they, they're working on it. So that's good to see. And, you know, giving feedback and then they're, they're listening to it. it's important. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the only thing they can really add is like maybe out of bounds on a couple of the holes to make it even a little bit harder. There's a couple of par fours where you can kind of throw it wherever you want. A couple of par fives where you can kind of throw it where you want. Um, if they wanted to get even more score separation, you could put some OB lining those fairways and making it, you know, making those holes just harder because you're not able to pitch out to an easier spot. You kind of got to keep it down the middle the whole way. I think that's where they need uh, the the force carries. Like I think that I think force carries are the future of disc golf design. I think that is what's going to really start changing the game. Now, obviously, it's not going to look the greatest because we can't put lakes and we can't put heavy rough that 
you know, is what basically golf courses do to force you to have to hit over something. But the hole that we just talked about, hole 14 at Portland, like imagine if there was, imagine if there was OB in that fairway that was, um, let's say like 50 to 70 feet long, similar to what they did at DDO. Like what they did at DDO on hole what about like eight? European Open hole three? When hole, part hole five three they... European Open hole eight yeah. at DDO of where you're basically making it to where now players have to make a decision. Do I want to lay up short? Or if you throw a bad tee shot, now they have to make a decision. Like, do I want to try to get over the force carry? Yeah, right? like, I, 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 I love that, that a lot. I, um, Texas no State had that too. <laughs> Texas State yeah, had yeah. that on hole three as well, I think. Three, three, they like, have a you have to go for it. They have a hole like that here at uh, Beaver? The Beaver State. Yeah. Not, I think they're slowly. No, 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 are, but it's not like what, it's not what you think. Good? What is that? It, oh, no. It's a new hole. It's a new hole where they put the OB like 13 to 12 feet short of the basket on. Oh. God, have you played it yet, Gannon? No. I know what you're talking about. It's like it's old hole two at east or west. Yes. So it used to be big hyzer around the corner. You get in position and it's like the most beautiful green ever. It's nice. Oh, that's like cove. Proper. Yeah. They that made the cove green. out of bounds. Uh, that little water strip right there. Mm-hmm. So it's only like five feet wide. No, it's like probably 25 feet wide. And then, well, we'll probably like. I'm okay with that though. Cause that hole was too feet. easy. That hole was too easy. No, no, no. Far, and then they super far apart three put, now. Yeah, it's four forty now. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I heard it's like four four fifty and like <laughs> you throw the best shot ever. And if you come up like one foot short, you're just basically taking a bogey. Yeah. See, and if I you don't like, like clip that. anything, you're done. Yeah, it's awful. It's awful. <laughs> I, I want yeah, to get yeah. rid of it. Or, no, what holds this? No, 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 no. That's twelve. Incorrect. <laughs> Um, I want him to just get rid of it because it's a baller par three without it. Without the OB. Oh, that, that's, that's sick, what I'm yeah. talking about. That's like one of the, the par threes that I like is you can rip a fairway driver super hard or a driver. And it's just kind of like a it's a it's a, well, it's a bonus birdie par three, but it's not unfair if you like you have to take yeah. that OB away, you know. That those are my yeah. favorite holes. The problem with the force carries is it's gonna make my lifespan a lot shorter because I'm stressed all the time when I have to think about that. <laughs> That's that's what I want to see. I want to see where I know you know people have to constantly be thinking about Think, what yeah. what they need to do. Like that's that is one part of disc golf that we did not take from golf is like yeah. let's not actually have to think about anything. Oh, like let's not let's not even make you think about how to throw your shot differently. Here, just throw it exactly the same, and here's a disc that will do it for you. Like, and that's. That's a whole different other story, but if we really wanted to see disc golf get super creative, it's like let's limit how many discs you can have because then players would have to really get creative yeah. with their shots versus there are guys out there that throw the same exact shot. They just change the disc. I was, I was going to say, like, I, I don't know if I like that. I feel like people would be better if they were forced to throw less discs. Maybe. I mean, I, I, think, I think people on tour bag way too many discs sometimes. I feel like, I feel like if you're bagging more than like 23, that's that's a lot. 43 right now, Brad. Out of count, 43 <laughs> of those bad boys. We got we got Jake Jake Wolf at like 75 or something. Yeah, he's got two two <laughs> Gannon, times. Gannon, question with where, where you're at, where you are right now, how consistent you've been playing. When you play good, is there somebody out there that you're worried about, or do you know at this point? where you're at if you just play good gannon golf you're gonna win or are there or are there skill levels still out there that that will match that like where's your mental at as far as that goes i mean the two i worry about obviously are calvin and ab um ab has a i don't know they all have their they all, all have their like good parts and bad parts ab has that big forehand and he's you know it's not just big he throws a lot of different shots with it um Calvin also has a forehand, but it's not that. I feel like he doesn't lean on it that much. It's very usable. It's, it's not it's like it's a bad forehand or he shanks it off and he just doesn't throw it that much. 
But those two players, for sure, I mean, when AB was really hot at the beginning of the year, I mean, it felt almost impossible to beat him. But at the same time, I was I was keeping up pretty decent. I feel like this year specifically, I've already had a lot of hot, hot rounds, more than I've ever had in my life, where I'm just like, if I get going on a round, you know, I've had a lot of like 10, 70 plus rounds this year already. Um, and I've had a couple of tournaments where I average really high as well. Uh, I, I feel like my ceiling is is increasing this year for sure. Mm. I just feel like I'm I'm able to get more under par for a tournament than I have been in the past. Um, more consistently, like it's happening more often. Why do you think that um, is? Um, I don't know. I, I think I'm well. I'm really comfortable with my bag. Like I said, I don't bag that many discs, and so when I walk up to a hole there's almost always just one disc that can work for the hole. You know, I, I bagged three drivers. I bagged four fairways. I only bagged three mids right now, two throwing putters and putting putters. So <laughs> have you ever thought uh, about just popping a little like 20 extra ball in there and seeing maybe if you were like, what if you start averaging like 11 hundo dude? Uh, I, I feel if I like, I don't know. I, if I have to think, well, here, here's my problem. I, I do have a little bit of like it a It goes back problem. to the thinking. <laughs> well, yeah, like, well, if I throw a shot, if I bag a lot of discs and I throw a shot with a disc and I'm between discs, I'm on a tee pad, I'm like, I have three discs in my hand, I have three discs that can make this shot work, then, you know, maybe I throw it and it flips a little more than I was expecting it to. Well, then it just feels like I it was the disc's fault, not my fault. But if I if I only have one disc that can work for that shot, it's – from in my opinion, it's always my fault if I throw it bad. You know, you can still get unlucky wind balances and stuff like that, or but you really just get in tune with your discs. And if you're yeah. like, if you're really mentally in tune with your discs, you you can you can go so far in this sport because then once you have a disc locked in, then your actual skill of throwing just a disc in general, I feel like can be applied to the course a little bit more, if that makes sense. I feel like you can... Hey, Brad, yeah. Brad, get rid of my discs, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Just start them chucking them out of there. <laughs> get, get me to 20 discs, buddy. I, mean, I can fit my whole bag in my hand, pretty much. I can fit, like, 12 discs in my hand. I don't even need to bring a bag on the Pro Tour. But, um, you know, I, I like I said, I, I like walking up to a hole. I see it. I know this is going to be a driver, hyzer, flip to flat, and then fade if I need a little distance. Or if there's some headwind, I'll just throw my straight PD2. If there's no, if there's a lot of headwind, I'll go beefy PD2. So it's just like super easy. It's my fault if I throw a bad shot. I don't know. It makes it makes disc golf simple. Takes thinking out of it. I know Simon Simon does that a lot too. I mean, he throws that. I think it's a dimension, that white and black rim driver. He throws a hex and he throws a Tesla and that's like his whole bag and he plays amazing. And so, I don't know. You can, you can look at it both ways. That's keep just how simple. I like to play. Yeah, yeah. Keep it simple. Um, so you did bring up a B and Calvin as the two guys that you look at as like your biggest competitors. And, um, you know, no surprise here. Those are the two guys that I would say going into this tournament, those were the two guys that everyone had on their player of the year ballots, right? And we're now halfway through the season. So the player of the year is only going to ramp up after every tournament. People love talking about it. So we had uh, our stats guy, Edwin Stats, pull up a graphic with you three and uh, a little comparison here. So looking at this, you have elite, major, elite and major wins. AB leads with three. You and Calvin both have two. Average finish, you actually lead in that category at 5.1. Calvin's at 10.1 and AB's at 11. Uh, birdie rate, you lead in that category, 47.5%. Uh, Fairways hit, you lead in that category over AB and Calvin, but you're eighth on tour. Greens in regulation, Calvin actually leads in that category at 45.3, but you're just behind at 44.8. Scramble, you're actually first in the in scramble as well at 51.7. Your C1X putting is six, and your C2 putting is seventh. So looking at all these, you know, you're pretty much top 10 in all these statistics, and you're only getting beat by A B one win, and then Calvin's beating you by 0.5 in greens and regulation. So if voting ended now, 
And everyone that's listening, we've got, you know, 729 people listening right now. And we could all vote. What would be your spiel to get people to vote for you? Okay. Um, I guess this is all a humble take, I guess. Um, yeah, no, we all, you should tell people to vote for you. So we all know okay. that I'm, I'm okay. putting you on the spot. Okay. Um, one of the things to look at is I have the lowest average finish by almost double, by I think double. Um, that's important. I think staying consistent the whole year. That's why Calvin won player of the year last year was because of his consistency. Um, you know, he didn't have the most wins. He only, he only finished with two wins on the year last year, but he had so many consistent finishes. He was always up there in contention. So throughout the span of the year, he was always, you know, more consistent. Um, you know, you, you can look at the elite pluses as a little bit of a bonus when it comes to the wins. They're a little bit tougher to win. They do mean a little bit more. There's only three the entire year compared to however many 10 plus normal elite series there are. Um, and I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Honestly, I, I don't know if like the, the other types of stats matter too much. Um, but if we're looking at, you know, just wins and average finish, those are like the top two things that come to my mind. What about majors as far? Do we have the statistics as far as like who's finishing better at the, the, the major? Oh, cause I obviously I major Calvin majors are the big thing. Yeah, I think Calvin got like six at Champions Cup and then me and AB tied at 10th. Okay. Do you think there's any sort of eye test that should be a part of player voting? Like, ooh, this guy, I just like the way this guy plays. I like the way this guy throws. I, I think I like that's the way like this that, guy putts. I think I would lose that to both Calvin and AB, unfortunately. <laughs> I feel like I have a pretty boring a pretty boring game. They, they both are, I don't know, a little more exciting to watch. I enjoy watching them, I think, more than how I play. I play very, I feel like, by the book. I just kind of break holes down. I feel like oh, how they were designed. Um, I, I do a couple, like, fun, crazy shots. You know, I, I had them put that Mando in at KC wide open last year. Um, you know, we had a crowd, so I wanted to do it for fun. And yep. it worked, It worked, which, which was an even better part. But, you know, there's certain stuff I like to do like that, you know. Um, obviously, I have, like, Alden's YouTube. That helps. Um, but... I, th I think on the course they're a little more exciting to watch than I am. I don't know, man. Watching people make a bunch of long putts is one thing that has elevated a lot of people's games over the past few years. Like you think about Ricky Waisaki, polished off the tee. I don't know. Scrambling crazy. Mm -hmm. And then his circle two putting is really what gave him his name. You know what I mean? Because he made a lot of big time putts from deep C2 to track down Paul Macbeth when they were going at it, you know, in those years, like 2016, 2018 type thing. So don't yeah. sell yourself short. Yeah. You, we have D Daniel in the chat says, I actually like watching Gannon the most of the three. So well, shout, uh, shout out to Daniel. I, I appreciate Daniel. Is that, <laughs> that might be my dad though. <laughs> um, does not look like your father. Okay. Just going just to throw it that, out there. That is my dad's name. We can uh, never trust the avatars, though. I, that, that is one thing. Never trust okay, the avatars. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, he said, you can, be my, he said goes, you can be my son. <laughs> well, I was, was going to say one thing. is like I, I am very proud of my uh, – my one of my favorite stats is the scramble stat. Um, I believe this is my third or fourth year in a row being in the top three in that category. I hate um, that category. I, I think – I think like when <laughs> – That category like is the worst one, Gannon. I, I know, I know your opinion on it, but I guess just like looking at it, whenever I'm in the woods in a tricky position, yes. obviously being tall helps a lot. Scrambling also, you have to be putting good to scramble well for it to count toward your scramble rate. And not be throwing OB. Yeah, so like, so, but I feel like when I'm in the woods sometimes though, I feel like I do a really good job of, you know, having that, that good vision, I guess, in the woods, really seeing the line I want to hit putting the disc on the angle, always giving myself a chance at least. So I, I feel like that's something I like when I, when I get off the fairway, I, I don't really get that scared because I feel like I can almost always find a way. I feel like I have a, a good scrambling mind, I guess you could say. And putting this year, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at considering, you know, I put with the same putter for seven years and I just switched to something pretty different. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been putting pretty solid recently. 
Um, these last two tournaments have been really good for me. I'm really starting to lock in with my links right now. So that feels good. Those are those are two things that stand out a little bit to me. What I want to see with scrambling, Gannon, is and this probably would favor you because I, I agree. You do have a really good scramble game. Uh, you can throw from all different angles and you're comfortable, like you said, like being your height. You're comfortable being able to throw a lot of different shots, right? You can you can throw above your shoulder, you can throw below your knees. All that really helps when it comes to scrambling. But what I want to see is literally, I think scrambling should just be a statistic that looks at when you're off the fairway, not out of bounds, and then did you throw it inside a circle two or not? And that yeah, should be what it is. Like, take away the putting, take away the OB. course, and you just chuck it OB. You have a wide open 350 foot up shot. That's not a, it's not really a scramble. Correct. It wasn't, there's no, there's no like thinking. You're still just throwing a spike hyzer. And know? then also if you throw like a crazy flex shot out of these bushes and trees and get to 40 feet and then you miss the putt, you don't that, get doesn't all, that also doesn't really show that you're really good at getting out of those sticky spots though. Yeah. I, I think they what? can adjust that a little bit to make it a better statistic. Yeah. I, I wish they would like release the stats like they had last year. I don't, I haven't seen where we can see those yet. That's right. Not to, uh, you know, they just got the cut line. It took them, it took them about four months <laughs> to get the cut line. Okay. Let's, let's yeah. ease up. Let's ease up here. Let's I ease know, up. I know, I know <laughs> some, some people have it, but uh, they're, they're not giving it to us I'm, for some reason. <laughs> I'm ready for them to get, dude, my big, becoming my pet peeve. We'll, we'll talk about it at the end when we ask what your new pet peeves are. But right now, dude, these circle one, circle two greens hits are driving me more and more nuts every <laughs> single week. They're driving me nuts. It's not the green, bro. It's not the green. If you're throwing a sidearm putt from 28 feet, you miss the green, you hit circle one. I think circle one should just be for a rule. You can't fall forward in circle one. That's all we have. Are you talking for. about like uh, Ricky's horseshoe putt he had on? Like, yeah, like no putt. <laughs> That's he didn't hit the green. He didn't hit the green. He's having to scramble from that little spot right there. The greens need to be mapped better. Sometimes you could hit the green from 50 feet and you actually hit a green yeah, because you have yeah. a wide open stroke, nothing in the way. You make it, you hit the green, green is that, hit. That's is that the best what, way to make that putt? What? I'm trying to think. Because he had yeah, to, he, he had to go right of the he had to go right of the tree, right? He couldn't go yeah, either that it, or a little two piece. It looked, it looked pretty hard. He almost he made could've, it. He could have done like a high, like, like well, a high sometimes floater. you can do like a kind of like a nose up like pusher where you push it out of your hand and then it kind of swoops left quick. Yeah. That's like the only other way I think he could have made it. But I don't know. It's that's that's also a tough one Chicken because <laughs> that that like it doesn't come into play that often, you know, like yeah. 95% of greens, if you're in circle one, you almost always have a putt. So it's like, I, I know what you're saying. I also would like that to be a thing, but it's kind of kind of a weird thing. You know, there's a lot of things in disc golf. Like we, I don't know, we, we wish we like had, I guess, or we had a solution for, but it's kind of tricky, to, I don't tricky think, to figure out. I don't think 95% of the time you hit this or 90% of the time you hit the circle, you have a wide open putt. I don't think so. I think that's false. Well, when you have eight foot legs, you do. Yeah, that's, but you're having to facts. straddle that out, and you're not doing your regular putt. That is also fast. I, 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 well, I guess it's, I guess I was considering that as like an open putt. Like you have, you can straddle to a line. Sure, you can straddle to a line, but you don't have. That's not where you are aiming. You have to manufacture a new stance to have a wide open look at the hole. You miss the green, dude. Sorry, bud. That is kind of that. He does make a point of where. If you're having to alter your stance to get to a spot to where you can throw a, sh uh, a make a putt, then maybe that shouldn't. Now, it, it, Yuli, it does get weird on with straddle putters. Oh, blah blah blah. Well, no, 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 no. I'm if saying <laughs> no, no. I'm saying it does get weird on like how are you going to make the hole? How are you going to make the green on like hole nine at Idlewild? That little par three. That's just a little turnover shot. There's like six six trees inside a circle that are like all over the place. Like how, what does that green look like? Like a, it looks weird. Like it looks yeah, really weird. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, it's I'm a weird a, looking green. That's I'm, fine. I'm Guess what? There's some, there's some weird looking greens out there. It's not <laughs> our fault. We're playing a weird game, but uh, if you're having to straddle, you didn't hit the green. That's my, that's my take. Okay. Okay. My take. <laughs> 
I I actually I love a green like that. I so I'm a big fan of greens where you have trees about I don't know. Tw- you about, love a circle like that. Like <laughs> I, I I like tr- I like greens that have a a you know trees around like 20 to 25 feet from the basket. So you know if you throw a shot, you get unlucky, you hit them. You it's it tests your putting still, but you don't get like screwed. There's a lot of holes we play on tour where they put the the guardian trees that. You're not you're not even aiming for a gap. They put those like 55 oh, short. Yeah. I hate that. That yeah. that's my biggest pet peeve when it comes to course design is when you put when you put trees inside deep circle two where you're not actually aiming. It's so far down the fairway, you're not even aiming at that point. Just chuck yeah. and hope for the best. They yeah, they have that like, uh what hole is that at um like Fox Hills? The it's like a kind of a blind shot over the hill, and they had that guy there to be our mandatory guy because you can't even see the mandatory tree anymore oh yeah 15. it's the one right before ricky's disc hit 14. like the umbrella is it 14? 14. yeah yeah, yeah like we don't we came we can't even see the gap there so we're just like trying to chuck a shot that that whole two at deglo was also really bad you remember that one where we just chuck it that was actually a fun one though we just chucked it off the hill and then we just crashed it into the trees and yeah, we just hoped, yeah. <laughs> hoped for it to like plinko down. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I don't like holes that like if you just chuck a shot, no, yeah. if you just if you walk up to a hole and you're just like, yeah, I'm just gonna throw it that direction, that's a bad design. There's always yes. a better way to design a hole. Like but the one of the worst ones is Northwood's black hole. Um I believe it was six for Champions Cup layout. It's uh it's old, it's like hole nine usually at Northwood's black. It's right before you go out to the open. Uh, but it's an uphill essing par four. Uh, it's after the it's after the hole with the with the kind of logs behind the basket par three with OB right. That Fresno airballed that yeah. putt in the water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, okay, yes. It's the hole after that. So that hole. Yes. There's there's like a very small gap, but the the problem is is that hole is already so hard off the tee shot that if you throw a perfect tee shot. I think you should be able to get away with a little bit on the second shot. I mean, you shouldn't have to hit a five foot gap. And if you don't, you have a 70 footer for birdie, like, and then you got the same score as a guy who hit first available third to the, then the good landing zone. And then just throw, you got a lucky shot. Like that's not fair. You're going to love hole 14. Is it 14? Hold on. Uh, uh, oh no. It seems like it's always hole 14. 18, 17, Everywhere. 16. Is this worlds? I'm losing worlds. Yeah, 16, 15, 4. No, thir- thir- no, it's 12. It might be 12 actually. Oh boy. Uh, we'll anyways, never, we'll you're going to you're, you're going to love it because it's it's like not that far of a par 4. Like the ideal shot is like a mid and then like a zone, like a putter. It, so it's not very it's two placement shots but the uh the second shot they have like a thousand of these like little uh one foot trees <laughs> but put my it, hand around it it's gone but it's a but it is a perfect like 15 foot wide gap but to the left it's all these little one foot trees so if you miss you're just in and you're just like having to throw like a little yeah. knifey guy but it's like it's such a cool looking shot walking up to it and just seeing like that perfect I don't I, I like those holes too of where the gap is like later in the hole, not right off the tee. So like Austin, that, that hole where it's like that needle gap. R four sidearm layup, needle gap all the way there. Yes, yes, and similar. On the right. yeah. that, that but, one was okay. That but one was this a one's a little bit because it's not that far of a hole. Yeah, that that's yeah. It's, it's almost exactly that hole, but it like S is the other direction. It's it's a okay. great hole. It's a great hole. It's very very nice. I'm excited. I haven't I haven't played out there yet, so yeah. I, don't I think nobody played a course in Virginia. To me, New London is a um, it's one of the most fair wooded challenging courses. Like they do a great job of making holes very challenging without it being like hey. We're gonna stick a bunch of trees in the middle of the fairway. Good luck. That's I'm excited. That I like that. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be really fun. How's the, how's right. the golf what course compared to Portland? Uh, uh, way different. There there is gonna be elevation changes, which is nice, but it, there is very little like shot shaping. It's it's gonna be a lot more. It's gonna be a lot more landing zones. No, like, no. Yeah. Perfect. It's, 
It's a lot like USDGC. Perfect, it's gonna be a, perfect. It's going to be a lot like USDGC where it's like you need to land your you need to hit your landing zone to your OB. Awesome. Yeah. Uh the yeah, last hole whole 18 is your wings. Whole 18's wild. Oh gosh. Not for this course design. I relax. You and, don't celebrate? Uh, no. A little ice cream. Take I mean, your buddies out. I, I feel like that's what I do. Dinner. I just I just do that anyway. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe go like buy a Lego set or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I asked you. I I was the wrong person want... to ask that question. <laughs> a little Lego set? Yeah, what's, Lego what's set. What's the coolest what's the coolest Lego set you've ever built? Well, yeah, now we're I have to I get the Titanic right now and the Millennium Falcon, and those are uh, the Titanic's nine thousand pieces, and it's probably like four feet long. Is it is it the wow. intact Titanic or the split Titanic? It depends. You can you can have any way you want. It's in three pieces. <laughs> oh, you can't you can you can make yeah. it different ways. Yeah. Well, you you build it in three pieces, and you can put it together if you want. You don't have to. But then when you take it apart, it shows all the rooms inside. Oh, that's actually kind of sick. Cool. What 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 are the prices of these Lego things? Okay, the Titanic was six hundred bucks, and the Millennium Falcon was eight hundred and fifty bucks. Oh my god! So, I—that's like that's honestly the only thing I spend money on in life is that, and I guess my lodging for disc golf. Well, at least you're spending on stuff that's great investment. Yeah, yeah, great investment. <laughs> Those are going to be worth thousands uh, down the ride. Road hey, for you sure. never know. You never know. Hey, that's what people were saying about um, Beanie Babies. That's weird. Do you remember Beanie Babies? <laughs> I don't. I don't think I was around. I've no, you definitely weren't around. But I'm saying, do you like? Have, do you know what those are? I've heard of them. That purple, the purple guy, the purple bear. What? Yeah, there's a Barney purple Baby, the the bear. Barney, definitely not Barney. Wait, what are you talking about, Yuli? The purple oh. bear. Yeah, and they're a purple bear. That's like. <laughs> I have no like idea expensive. what you're talking about. Um, all right, let's pull up your statistics here, Gannon. I don't know if we showed this to you last time you were on the show. This is something new that Edwin's been doing where it's, where it's kind of like a um, it's kind of like your Madden rankings a little bit. So this is based off of oh wait, size got it. Is this it? Wait, how much is that? Fifty thousand baby? Yes. Is that a beanie baby? Yes, yes. I think I think that's hey. what is it called? Silence, what is that called? Oh yeah, Princess Di Yeah, Princess Diana. Yep, yep, yep. I've heard of the Princess All Diana right, bear. You know. No, I've heard you don't no, know. No, I've heard of the Princess Diana bear. I did not think it was a purple bear. I did not I've only oh, heard of Princess Diana Bear. I did not think it was a purple bear. I thought I was way off and I just was talking no, you're, some other collectible thing. We're gonna see you on that antique road show, uh pulling up all <laughs> your all your beanie babies <laughs> purple, and Gannon's gonna roll in bears. all his Legos. Um okay, so And you'll have your baseball cards. It'll be perfect. I don't collect We're baseball gonna be rich, cards. guys. I don't collect baseball cards. Um put some respect to my name. Um okay, <laughs> so do. these are your Madden rankings, Gannon. Um, the highest you can be is 99. The lowest you can be is 70. And I believe, wait, did I say that wrong? Lowest you can be is 75. I don't know. But anyways, um, this is what we have you at. Scoring is at a 99. That is based off of actual statistics. So these are, these are actually off the statistics. The power is the only one that is, um, subjective. And that is at 96. Your accuracy is at 95. Your scramble is at 89. And your putting is at 87. Get that scramble up. Get that an, scramble up. For an overall 95. Yeah, how is scramble if he's the number one scrambler for the last three years? Why isn't that? I don't think roots? he is the number one scrambler. He said top three last three years. I, I think Edwin might have better. Might uh, I think Gannon's stats might Gannon, be uh, incorrect. I think he's I'm, I'm not. I'm not. No, I would never do that. Um, but what are your What's thoughts? My putting? my putting is trash too. Putting's eighty-seven. <laughs> That's it's pretty, uh, low. I mean, it's the, pretty low. My my claim to fame with putting was 
I was at 43% circle two at one point last season. And yeah, I that's finished ridiculous. 40. Yeah, that's... I think you might be the only person to ever... It yeah, might I don't be think the only... got over 40 except for me. No, I think you might be the only person to do that that plays as much as you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I mean, crazy. You can, definitely, you can definitely just play a couple like wooded courses, never have to play in the yeah, wind. Yeah, with no wind. <laughs> and, and maybe pull it off. Um, but yeah, that, that was pretty nutty. So... All right, uh, so you, you're saying the putting and scramble should be higher. Everything else you're fine with? Um, it's kind of hard to see, sorry. Um, I think my accuracy could be lower, and I think, I don't know. I'm not sure what to think about power. I feel like that's probably about right. I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I can throw 600 feet flat ground. I mean, I can keep up. I just don't have that extra gear. I don't have 700 like AB. 96 is pretty high. The, there's okay. only a there's That's only so a high. hand. Yeah, there's only a handful of people that are higher okay. than 96. I'll, I um, think that I, I'll take it. I mean, I, I, I never I never throw that hard in the course. So yeah, you don't. You have know, to. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um. So Edwin just gave us some statistics here. You're actually fourth in scramble. Ricky is at 55 percent. And you're at 51%. And when you do the math, it comes out to 89. So that's that's where you got your A. Oh, okay. And I think the only, yeah, the only people we've had on here that have higher power is A, B, and Simon. Simon's a wild card. I don't know. He is, he is a wild card. I agree. Sometimes but, he doesn't throw far and sometimes he does. So I don't even know about Simon anymore. You can, did he, was he chucking it at the All-Star event that one year though? It wasn't going that far. Oh, okay, Calvin. Calvin oh. is Calvin surprised me a couple years Cal- ago. Calvin Loki throws really far. Yeah, like he surprised me because I didn't think he threw that far, and then he was just like chucking like six hundred plus laser beams. Uh, yeah, he's got he's got like contest. a good six thirty. Yeah, nutty. Um, all right, before we let you go, pet peeves, Gannon. I know you kind of threw one out with the uh, with the. Um, Guardian trees in circle two, but anything else jumping out at you? That's got um, your gears all grinded up. This is this is not trying to be mean. Just you know, some, you're speaking facts. You're speaking facts. Yeah, I've had some bad problem. Everyone has had bad problems with scorekeepers. <laughs> Sometimes I get a feeling that they just want to get some free disc golf to watch. <laughs> well, <laughs> to be fair. To be and, fair, that's kind of what they need to do because yeah. like we need we kind of need them to want to volunteer. We're not paying them. I've had a lot of really good scorekeepers too, but I've also had a lot of just like scorekeepers that like it's like they've never had a phone in their entire life or never even watched <laughs> disc golf. I mean, you'll be 20 feet away and they'll be made 66 footer, made 66 footer. Like you have to physically put in that distance. It's like, I don't know. We had a uh, we had a scorekeeper. Shout out to this guy. He, if he's watching, shout out to him because it was an electric scorekeeper. Every hole, he was like the announcer on hole one, and uh, it was me, Ezra. I can't remember who else it was, but he's like for some T Brody, and then he'd be like, and finishing it off, Ezra. That's sick. Every, like every hole. Oh, every <laughs> hole. Every hole, oh, I yeah. Don't think I would like that every okay, hole. Now, <laughs> every <laughs> hole. Every I mean, he hole. Didn't mean any harm. He would like. He would basically tell us the order every time. We we didn't ask him. He would just do it. But he would like instead of just being like, "All right, it's Brody, Ezra, Isaac, and Calvin." He'd be like, "Brody, Ezra, Isaac, and Calvin." And we're like, "All right, cool, thanks." <laughs> <laughs> hole fourteen. Here we go. <laughs> That's sick. Um. Yeah, I don't get to answer to to respond to what you just said. I don't think there really is that much training going involved. Granted, to us, we've done it so much, it's not that difficult. But if you've never done it before and you're thrown in that kind of holy cow, I'm like having to score for Gannon and Calvin, like I could see how it's like a little bit of a pressure job. And if you don't have that, like any sort of training, um, I don't know. I, I think they could do something where it's like at least you kind of walk them through on how to use the app. That could yeah, definitely help. I, it's al- almost like you should have like a two-hole test and, and you watch some players play before and it's a, just to see how close they get. Because I don't know. Obviously, like you <laughs> said, we, we, we've been doing it a while, but 
I feel like if you know the general knowledge of circle one is 33, whatever feet circle two, 66, if you land barely inside the circle, you're 30 feet. If you land mid circle <laughs> two, you're 50 feet. It's like that, that part, I don't understand how they can be off by like 40 feet. Yeah. There, there's the statistics inside the circle are so skewed. I feel yeah. like I've never had a scorekeeper. If you're like, you know, if you're barely outside the bullseye, that's a putt. Like I've yeah. had so many bullseye putts in my life this year. I look at it and they're like, Paul made four putts inside the circle. I'm like, what the heck? Like, what? Yeah. Well, I, I take my own stats now because I don't want to, I want to have my stats accurate at the end of the year. Yeah. Steven makes a good uh, point too. He says a lot, a lot of scorekeepers are, uh, are being like dragged onto the course, like a few minutes before the card. Right. When, like when, when you're, you're in PJ live people. before you're about to take score, you have your four names next to the four names. If you go over, it'll say scores only scores, only scores, only whatever. If you click that box, you can do full stats for your own, for your name. Yep. Oh, wow. It's really quick. It's, it's just like you disc was, you just go fairway, fairway circle one in the basket. So it's not down to the exact foot. Like some of the scorekeepers are, but it's at least you're going to get your greens and regulation accurate and your putting accurate. I will gotcha. say though, like overall, the tournaments that I have played this year, it does seem like we're we are getting more knowledgeable scorekeepers than we have in the past. And I think it's only gonna get better and better. And um, you know, again, it's one of those things of where I don't think it makes any sense for the pro tour to be like, hey, we're gonna pull a thousand dollars out of the purse to pay for scorekeepers. Yeah. So it's always going to be a volunteer job. And um, as long as like they continue to learn, because that's another thing that we get asked a lot, Gannon, there's like people that just like, don't know, like, when should I ask for an autograph? Uh, where should I stand? Like, there's just so many people that have no idea uh, because disc golf is still such a young sport. And Ezra was telling me a story about one of their, one of their uh, scorekeepers, like didn't really have a sense of space. And so, like, he would be, like, lining up a shot, and then he'd, like, look over his shoulder, and the scorekeeper would be, like, standing, like, a foot away from him. What? And he'd be, like, he'd be, like, dude. Like, cause, and, again, it's, like, that that guy probably isn't thinking in his head, like, hey, oh, my gosh, look how close I am. Like, this is sick. Yeah. I'm, I'm breaking the rules. He just doesn't know that he should be 10 feet back. He's probably, like, I'm, I'm getting these statistics right yeah. out of the money. He's, like, staring, <laughs> staring at your foot. <laughs> see what the player sees. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've, I've had a lot of really good scorekeepers too, and I it always makes me feel good when I I have a scorekeeper. Oh, when you get a good scorekeeper, it's awesome. I look back at my round, like the dream scorekeeper is like, you know, they're quiet for pretty much the entire round, but sometimes they're actually like really cool to talk to, if like if they're actually like a super cool guy. Um, or girl, you know, or girl. I had I had one. I had a really cool scorekeeper. Um, which I thought was awesome because it's very rare to have just a female out there doing scorekeeping. I think it might have been my first, second time, but she was awesome too. She like just started playing disc golf and was like, yeah, I wanted to keep score. This is cool. So, nice. That's sick. Yeah. But yeah, just like, and they, you look back at your round and all your stats are right. And you're like, wow, this guy was awesome. Yeah. He, he, he kept his Here distance. Up. He, he only talked a little bit. Maybe if he had like a question or two, but you know, other than that, he stayed pretty quiet, you know, got, got the stats right. There you go. Perfect scorekeeper. Yeah. Europe was awesome. They didn't get any of them. They had one one wrong the whole weekend. One statistic it was sweet. Really? They take it pretty professional over there. They they for sure yeah. do training. I bet yeah. before before the tournament out there. Yeah. So, all right, you you want to hit him with the final question? Any new any new people you're looking at? You're like, Whew. I want There's that. No way. Some new players on tour. Yeah. Um, I wish I anything had like catching a, your eye. I wish I had a list in front of me. Uh, I mean, Gavin Rathbun's been playing really solid recently. Yeah. That's that's so good to see, um, especially coming after after that injury. Um, Joey Buckets, as usual, he's been real solid this year. He's always there's a there's a running joke in my friend group of just like, you know, you're you're about to tee off on your tee time, you check scores, and Joey Buckets seven down, no bogeys in the clubhouse, always, <laughs> yeah. always, every single time. Um, so what about, yeah, what about Connor Rock? You got to play with him quite a bit. Yeah. 
How's his yeah, game? He, yeah, he's he's been he's been getting definitely a lot better. Um, he definitely sells at open golf, especially if, if you have hyzers. He, I feel I feel like he, in terms of being well rounded and like angle control and consistency, he can definitely improve on that. But if you give him like a little bit of space to throw, he's able to like repeat a shot over and over and over again. And so, you know, I know he played pretty solid at Portland. There's a lot of shots where you kind of just. But once you feel comfortable with the line, you can just hit it every single time. Um, so I think it played to his strengths. But he's he's. I, I remember the first time I played with him, I was like, "Bang! This guy's got really good form, and he's actually he's pretty solid." So it's good to see him coming up, and he played great under the pressure at Las Vegas. So no problem there. Um, dang! Like I said, I really wish I had a, a list of people in front of me. Well, I'll I'll throw this comment in here. Steven throws bird says I watched Gannon put his final putt for the win up close. Fire emoji. Dude stayed and signed like a true professional. Yuli oh. signed my bricks. <laughs> Yuli signed my Brixton card. Fire emoji. Handshake. Brody skipped on me hard. <laughs> oh no, Brody. Bro. I wasn't at the tournament, no. Gannon. No, you skipped, bro. You skipped him. You're a skipper, I bro. Sk I skipped on him. I'll hit you up next year, Steven. I'll hit you up next year, brother. We'll get you. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, you're headed off to Beaver State Fling next, Gannon. Um, and then uh, headed back to the Midwest. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I'm playing Preserve in Des Moines. We got a week after Beaver State off until Preserve, and then a week after Preserve off, and then we play Des Moines. But And then I go over to Europe for three weeks for Crocole European Open in Estonia. Uh, and then flying back for Ledgestone. So it's going to be a long, like, kind of five-week stretch right there. But I'm excited. My first time out of the country. And to Oh, be, that's right. You didn't go to European Open no. last year. And to be to be uh, going to Europe, but I get to be at home for two weeks before is going to be awesome. I get to fly out of my hometown airport. So Wait, does that I'll mean be, you have a driver's license now? No, no driver's license. It's a passport. passport. I got a passport. All right. Well, right. uh, that's... That's a step in the right direction. It is. Listen, I mean, next year again, I might be driving. Oh, whoa. Hey, what, hey, big news, big news. What What would be your first car? Probably a Lamborghini. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Pro probably something pretty boring. I'm like, if you know me, I'm just very basic. I eat basic food. I wear basic clothes. I like Legos, like a nerd. I guess see you just, you just like rolling up to the nearest Target in your Lambo to get the newest Lego. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably my just like I don't know, Honda Civic rolling up. Hey, Honda Civic, that was my first car, super reliable. Hey, there we go. That was an my, option. My, my first car was a Accord, Honda Accord. Yeah, Hondas Hondas are great. My Maserati is kind of nasty, though. To be honest, it's still it's still crushing it. <laughs> Maserati. It's, it's still it's still crushing it. Kelsey Kelsey keeps getting on me. Um, go go car shopping, Gannon. Because us being tall, it is it is quite yes. hilarious. Because she was like, "Oh, I want you to try this," and she got me to try again this little Jaguar, oh. and I got in, and my head was like was like this, and I'm like. I'm I'm not I'm not driving this vehicle. Like this is t I was like I need to get in something where I feel like I, Yeah. I don't care what it looks like. I just want to feel comfortable. That's what matters. And the, the seats got to be comfortable. There's got to be like yes. the right, you know, not even just enough legroom, but the right legroom in the right area. It's just Correct. like it's just some, it's horrible. So, some have like decent legroom, but your knees jack it, up into like yeah. the dashboard. Yeah, it's 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 rough. It's rough, but you know we're not going to be shrinking anytime truck. soon. You need so. a truck. Just remember, you both need trucks. You guys are get guys out of here. I don't. What am I going to do with the What am I going to do with the truck bed, Yuli? Nothing. Um, drive it. Drive it. Put goes. your stuff in there. Sports. Um. Just remember, when you drive it off the lot, it appreciates immediately. L rule number one: Don't get a car ever. That is also a dark horse plan. A lot of people lease cars. That is a dark horse plan. You just always have a nice, nice new I car. Just, I might just you walk just everywhere. That is a, that's definitely a more dark horse plan and probably only works in certain cities. Probably not Des Moines, but 
You never know. You can People are saying horse. Everywhere. Carriage. Horse carriage. Oh, yeah. We got some of those in Iowa. Some nice horsepower. Yeah. So. All right, Dan, we'll let you go. Appreciate you jumping on here, brother. Always a fun time. And uh, congratulations on uh, taking down the Portland Open. That was exciting to watch. Yeah, it was awesome. Congrats, One buddy. of my favorite events. Thank you. Good luck this week. Thanks to my sponsors, Dismania, Squatch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank Everyone, you they, yeah, do your shout outs. Do your shout outs. Go for it. Yeah, Dismania, Squatch, Chump Chalk Bags, Titan Disc Golf. Uh, all the fans that came out to watch. Uh, Daniel, yeah, don't forget buddies. Daniel. Your buddies. Thanks, my buddies. Just thanks, my buddies. Thanks, Cole, for letting me stay at his house. That was sick. Mm. We, went, we went one and two in the Rodolin house. Wow. So that was that was a good week. I always stay up there for Portland Open, so that's always a super fun. We play disc golf and basketball all week. Um, yeah, always look forward to it. Can't wait for next year. All right, brother. Take it easy. Have a nice night. Thanks again. Peace.